Welcome to Living Safely with Dementia, Safety in the Home. There are two broad areas of safety that are impacted by living with dementia, that of safety in the home and that of disorientation and getting lost. Today, we're going to look at safety in and around the home and just touch on disorientation and getting lost because that is a topic with enough content for a full other session. Let's start by acknowledging that while every person is unique and therefore every person's experience of their dementia's progression is unique, there are some broad generalities that we can often make. One of those generalities is that when we're considering safety, we expect to see some changes as the disease progresses and things that maybe can be handled quite easily early in the journey become a lot more challenging and the risks increase as the disease progresses. Also, it's important to stress that anytime we talk about safety, there's no way to completely guarantee safety. Those of us without dementia have some risk in our lives. And of course, that's also true of any person living with dementia. As much as we might try to put mechanisms in place to keep everyone safe, as safe as possible, it's not realistic to get rid of all risks. So our goal for this session is that by the end, you'll be able to identify safety risks in the home, especially those that might be intensified because of the impact of dementia. You'll begin to create a plan to minimize and to get around some of those risks and consider some resources that can lessen some safety issues. But as a baseline, assume that it is probably not realistic to, to think that you're going to be able to get rid of all risk. So whether you are a person living with dementia who is also living on your own, or you are a care partner living with someone living with dementia, there will be some differences as far as accommodations that need to be made for safety and other accommodations still more depending on whether the person living with dementia is able to be at home alone from time to time. As we look at various areas of safety, we'll take a three-pronged approach with the first being prevention. As much as possible, if we can prevent a problem, it makes it a whole lot easier than trying to pick up afterwards. You are starting this process of acting now to try and avoid accidents and serious situations and of planning for the future by participating in this session and learning more about changes that dementia is likely to bring into your lives. Part of planning for the future is adapting the environment for future changes and looking at the physical environment, understanding the changes that a progressive dementia is likely to bring to the person living with dementia. For example, in response to learning that progressive changes in the brain often impact vision and balance, you might decide to install specialized bathtub railings and mark the edges of the tub to increase visibility, or put special locks on entrance doors or on the gate out of the back garden. Understanding the changes that a progressive dementia is likely to cause can help us to minimize future dangers. Another example, knowing that reading and comprehension may become more difficult, we may change the way we store poisonous substances and what we do with electrical cords. All of these can make a big difference in terms of safety. You may find at the end of this presentation you have one long list of to-dos. And learning about safety, as well as trying to plan for the future while dementia brings more and more changes, is a big job. We want to help. So at the end of the session, you'll see our contact information for our Dementia Helpline. We are here to help you talk over the ideas in this session and to help you work toward next steps. Take a look at this cartoon of a complete safety nightmare and have a look at some of the different safety risks that are shown. There are cobwebs in the medicine cabinet. Do you think that might mean in terms of safety? 
Do you notice the smoldering cigarette perched on the table slightly behind the person watching TV? Do you notice the boxes of things on the stairs? Am I the only one who sets things on the stairs to take them up or down the next time I go? I need to recognize, we all do, that that is a safety risk. There are no hand railings on the stairs. Going back to the medicine cabinet, the cabinet is open and the medication is um, stored very, very confusingly. Um, it looks as though there's, you know, perhaps the cobwebs suggest that there's expired medications in there. And there's medications in the cabinet, on top of the cabinet, on the table below the cabinet. Which ones are the most correct? The smoke detector is unhooked. There's cords running across the entrance to the room and under the chair, right where the person's feet would come down. There's too many things plugged into serial extension cords. The heater seems to be being used as a drying rack. Um, and there are piled newspapers nearby. There are scatter rugs all over the place and they're um, tipped up on the corners and rumpled in the middle. There's overflowing and probably poorly working coffee pot. While this session today is looking at safety from the vantage point of someone who is living with dementia or who is caring for someone who is living with dementia, it's important to note that all of these things are relevant for each of us to keep in mind when we look at our own personal safety. We're not going to cover an exhaustive list by any means, but hopefully by the end of this session, you will note a few little red flags for yourself that you can start to address in the next little while. Medications is one of those areas that really changes for a person living with dementia, depending whether you're living on your own and how early or late you are in the disease progression. Early in the progression of dementia, you may find a weekly pill container is enough, even if the care partner needs to be the one putting in the various pills. Or perhaps you need a, a blister pack to help identify which medications to take at which times. When those times come up, you go to the blister pack and pop out the correct pills for that particular time. However, if you are the person living with dementia, as time goes on, dementia may rob you of that sense of time, and you may not remember that it's noon and you're supposed to pop out the pills from your blister pack. Or you may forget that you've already taken out the lunchtime dose, and so you pop out the next blister as well. Obviously, missing doses or double or triple doses is problematic, and depending on the medication, could be dangerous. In that case, something like an automatic pill dispenser might be more useful. There are a wide variety of automatic medication dispensers available, some of which include remote monitoring and care partner notification for missed doses. For all of them, the idea is that the medication gets loaded and the dispenser programmed and an alarm goes off at the appropriate time with access to only the pills for that time. So you may be sitting watching TV and the buzzer goes off and you think, yeah, okay, it's four o'clock. It's time for me to take my green pill and my yellow pill. However, as time goes on and the cognitive and brain changes continue to accumulate, even that may be a challenge. A person may be sitting watching TV and the buzzer goes off and they become agitated and distressed because what's that noise? Where is it coming from? Our goal is to help someone take the medication when and how they are supposed to be taken. And so we have to adapt our strategies as the disease progresses.
Sometimes what ends up being very helpful is having support coming in to monitor and dispense the medication. So a home support worker who pops in once or twice a day and gets the person their medication may be the way to go. Keep in mind that for all of us, not just those of us living with dementia, it's important to ensure that a medication review is done on a regular basis. What often happens, particularly for people that have some kind of chronic condition, is that you're on medication X now because your primary physician prescribed medication X some time ago and they just keep renewing your prescription annually without actually looking at whether medication X is still the best medication or if the dose is still the best dose. This can be particularly true if something was prescribed during a hospital stay or from a specialist where perhaps it was related to a specific issue, or if you've changed doctors and a medication was prescribed by a previous doctor. An overall medication review looks at all the medications together and it may reveal that you no longer need medication X at all, or that in fact there's a newer medication that would be much better, or that medication X is good, but you don't need nearly as large a dose as when you were younger. Did you know that the way the liver processes drugs changes as we age? And so you may need far less of the medication than you did when you were younger. Having a physician or a geriatrician who understands our aging bodies or even a pharmacist review every medication you or anyone is taking on a fairly regular basis, at least annually, can make a big difference in terms of what is actually needed. As for food, most of us are aware that with some kinds of food, Expiration dates are pretty loosey-goosey. For example, if your milk says that it's good until the 9th, sometimes it's good until the 15th. You have a quick little whiff and you realize that it smells good and fresh and you keep drinking it because you know it hasn't gone bad. Conversely, you know there are other foods where you have to be much more careful about the expiration date. What often happens with people with dementia is that the senses of smell and taste change as the disease progresses. So if you are not the person living with dementia and with the related brain changes, you may open a package of processed meat, have a whiff and go, ooh, that's not good, and you throw it out. However, someone with dementia either may not even think to check with a sniff or they may not recognize that the meat smells bad and they may just go ahead and make a sandwich with bad meat, not taste anything different, and then afterwards get sick from us. Understanding that dementia causes changes in the brain can help us understand that at a certain point, someone other than the person living with dementia is likely going to need to monitor the food on a regular basis and check to make sure the food in the fridge and in the cupboards is fresh and edible. Another thing that comes up is food preparation. The stove can cause a lot of challenges for a person living with dementia as time goes on. An example of this might be putting the electric kettle on the stovetop and turning on the element to boil water to make tea, because in that moment, your memory is accessing information from 20 or 30 years ago when you didn't use an electric kettle and you had, an elect uh, had a kettle that you popped onto the stove and turned the element on. But now you do have an electric kettle and you've turned the st stove element on underneath it and now there's wires and plastic melting on the element and it's a real mess. So unfortunately the stove at some point often has to be disabled. Another very common example is putting a pot of food on the stove, turning it on and then going off to do something else, forgetting about it and it burns or even catches fire. 
or something in the oven that gets burned to a crisp or that there's food in the oven and the oven has an automatic clean cycle that gets turned on and causes flames. This kind of thing can happen to any of us, but when it starts to happen more frequently, care partners need to step in. It could be that the stove breaker gets turned off or an automatic shutoff gets installed or in some way the stove is disabled. And if the person living with dementia is no longer able to understand the consequences of their action and the necessity of disabling the stove, it can be helpful that when the person goes to use it and they notice that it's broken, we can say something like, oh, that's right. We're just going to have to get the repairman in. Why don't you use the microwave for now? However, because dementia is progressive, we also need to be aware that at some point the microwave may become unsafe because you could put a metal plate in it and cause sparking and cause the microwave to short out or catch fire. Or you cook something for 12 minutes and again, it could be burnt. Or 12 seconds and the food is still raw. So it's something that you need to monitor gradually as the disease progresses, adjusting along the way according to what works. At some point, meal delivery is often the very best bet for a person, particularly who's living on their own. Many communities have a variety of meal delivery services, or you may enlist the help of friends and family to help with this if you're in a community without this service. Contact our First Link Dementia Helpline, the number is at the end of this presentation, and ask for a list of community resources, which may include local meal delivery services. Our homes almost all contain some hazardous substances, and sometimes locked cabinets may be the best bet, because many cleaning supplies can be toxic. If someone mistakes the bleach for the vinegar, they may be putting the bleach on their french fries or something like that. And so putting dangerous substances in locked cabinets only to be accessed when someone is around who will know what's what with the substances is probably the best bet. One of the safest things to do is simply simplify. So take a critical look at your cleaning supplies to keep only what is necessary. Think about what you can get rid of and where you can substitute with something non-toxic. For example, you might be used to using some specific strong cleaner and it's great and it smells good and it does a really good job of cleaning. But that cleanser can be a real risk if the person living with dementia starts to not really recognize what this substance is. It may be caustic, it may be poisonous, it may be both. And so it may be that you need to consider whether vinegar will do the trick. We can clean just about as well with vinegar as we can with the heavy duty cleanser and vinegar is non-toxic. It also becomes important to clearly mark containers. However, know that at some point the person with dementia will likely not be able to read or understand what they're reading, what is written on the container. So you don't want to rely on labels over the long term. Because of that, it's also a really good idea to not put substances in other containers like, for example, there was a split in your bleach bottle, and so you pour it into the 7-Up bottle that's nearby and instead. You clearly mark it as bleach, but someone seeing clear liquid in it may take a slug without seeing the label or understanding the label. So make sure that nothing is in a container that could possibly be misconstrued for something else. Another recent example that happened recently with a colleague of mine is that she put her eye drops up on a shelf and noticed that it was beside a bottle of liquid paper that looked very similar. 
She says she even thought at the time, wow, those bottles look similar. I must be careful not to mix them up. Sure enough, in the hurry of getting ready one morning, she poured liquid paper directly into her eye. She's fine, thank goodness. But it was a great reminder that safety in the home is for all of us. Dementia simply adds another layer to the need for vigilance. Fire risks and electrical hazards are another area that apply to all of us, not specifically to people living with dementia. So much of this information is information you already know, but it bears repeating. Check the batteries in your smoke alarm and make sure the smoke detector is working. Don't throw the breaker if your smoke detector is wired in simply because it's irritating when the smoke detector goes off while you're baking cookies or making toast in the morning. Having a working smoke detector is well worth the trade-off as far as real safety and alerting you to problems that might result from some of the following things that we're going to look at. If you use space heaters, check and make sure that those space heaters are located in a safe position. That means not right beside the curtains, not right next to that pile of old newspapers that somebody in the house is going to get around to reading one of these days, not next to a couple of paint cans that you're going to use in a little while. And if you remember the cartoon at the beginning, that the space heater is not being used as some kind of fast drying rack. You'd also need to make sure that the heater is um, located in a safe spot with lots of open space around them, that the cord is running close to a wall and not across a walkway, and that the heater is not too close to any person which could cause a burn. Check your electrical appliances. There's often wear and tear on the cords and plugs and even the on-off switches. So whether you live with the person living with dementia or not, do a little inventory and check and make sure that electrical appliances are in good repair. When someone who is cognitively intact plugs in an appliance that has an electrical short, they would likely recognize that kind of electrical burnt rubber kind of smell, and it would alert them that something was wrong. Very likely, they would pull the plug out of the wall. However, understanding that dementia is a brain disease, if the part of the brain that is responsible for critical judgment is impaired, then the person living with dementia may not pay attention to that smell or even recognize that the smell is important information. Significant damage could potentially happen before anybody realized that something was wrong. The same thing applies to electrical outlets and power bars. Check to ensure that electrical outlets are not overtaxed. That is, look out for the extension cord attached to the power bar, attached to the other power bar with cords coming out all over the place, something a friend of mine used to call better living through extension cords. Clearly, there are times when it's unavoidable to have an extension cord that goes from one end of the room to the other, but have a critical look at the extension cords, where they're being used and what's being plugged into them. Make sure that they're running safely alongside the wall and not stretched across walkways. One person's mom had a two-prong extension cord and his mom had cut the little nub off the end so that she could plug in a three-prong plug. And she had a couple of other cords that were a bit frayed and so she just wrapped them with electrical tape. When her son did an inspection and found these dangerous items, he just quietly replaced the extension cords with proper three-prong grounded extension cords and over time removed the older ones from his mum's home. And as much as possible, 
switch over appliances to ones which have an automatic shutoff, like a kettle that boils and as soon as it's boiled it shuts off on its own, or an iron that if you haven't used it for a couple of minutes or if it's left unmoving and face down for more than a couple of seconds, it shuts off. Essentially look into whether any appliance that the person would like to continue using can be replaced with a version with an automatic shutoff. The bathroom is often called the most unsafe room in the house, and the risk certainly does not go down if you're living with dementia. So consider using a bathtub mat in the tub. As dementia progresses, you may see the appearance of some of the more commonly shared symptoms. Coordination may be poorer because of changes to the cerebellum, which means that a person's sense of where they are in space is affected. Someone with these brain changes may not be sure about putting their foot down because they're not exactly sure where their foot is in space. Also, the occipital lobes are often affected and that can impact depth perception. So a person may not have a clear sense of how far down things go. And so a bathtub mat can certainly help to give a bit more stability in the tub as well as a visual cue as to where the bottom of the tub is. However, make sure it's not a very dark colored bath mat because the brain of a person living with dementia may tell them that they would be stepping into a hole, which of course no one would want to do. Also, as dementia progresses, some people become quite afraid of water. So if you take a fear of water and you add a dark bath mat that seems to be a deep hole, it's very likely to result in a high degree of fear and very understandable resistance to getting into the tub. Water temperature is a pretty individual thing. You might really like hot water in your shower or for it to be really hot when you stick dishes in the sink um, so that you know you're really going to be able to get those dishes clean. However, if you were going to just wash your hands in that water, you'd probably have to turn on more cold water to reduce the temperature. Because of changes in the brain, someone living with dementia may not be able to exercise the, that judgment. And so they may put their hands into that very hot water and scald themselves or turn the shower on to full hot and just step in. So it's a good idea to lower the temperature of the hot water tank so that the water is not at a dangerous temperature for someone who may not be checking. An easy access bathtub can make life so much easier if there are any issues around flexibility and coordination. It could be a full easy access tub with a swing out door or it could be as simple as adding a good shower chair. Safety bars positioned to help with getting in and out of the tub and shower and to assist with stability around the toilet are often the first thing that we think about when we think about bathroom safety. It's very important to either to do your research or to contact an expert to assist with positioning and with secure mounting. These bars need to be able to safely hold an adult's sudden weight. Imagine if you slip and grab them for stability. And while a taller toilet is often called comfort height toilet, that additional height is also a safety feature that can greatly assist with stability and independence. You may also want to consider leaving the lights in the bathroom on 24-7. Brightly lit spaces provide a safer environment and a lit bathroom is easier to find at night. Speaking of lighting, good lighting is imperative. Shadows and dim lighting can increase confusion, fall risk, and even lead to hallucinations. Adequate lighting in the home will help with safety. 
You may love to have your kitchen floor washed and wax and gleaming so that you can see your face in it. But for some of us who are a little shaky on our feet, this gleaming, slippery surface can mean increased instability. Not having highly waxed floors is safer for someone with cognitive changes because it isn't just the physical danger of slipping on that shiny floor, but that the glare itself can be disconcerting. With possible changes to the way the brain processes visual information, the way the light reflects off things may make it very difficult to see where the floor is. And if faces are reflected in the floor, someone might actually find it a little scary and wonder, is that a pool of water? Is there someone under the surface of the water? If you have an occipital, ther occipital an occupational therapist come into your home and do a safety assessment, one of the things they will likely identify is scatter rugs. Many of us have small rugs at our doorways and in front of our sink, but they can be a tremendous tripping hazard. I'm sure I'm not the only one who's caught my toes on a raised corner and stumbled. For those of us who are unstable, a stumble usually leads to a fall. So getting rid of any scatter rugs is highly recommended. Or if you absolutely can't bring yourself to get rid of them, ensure they have a non-slip backing and are of a heavier material without curling edge. Furniture placement is something you may not have thought of, but make sure there's enough room in between the coffee table and the easy chair or whatever it is that's in the room for easy navigation. Walk through the house yourself, looking at it from the point of view of a person who is perhaps a little shaky and who perhaps has compromised depth perception. They may need a little more space between the furniture. Look critically at spacing, and this can be particularly important if the person has a walker or around the Christmas season because often at that time the furniture in the living room gets moved around a bit to accommodate a big tree. We all get used to furniture being in one spot and we have probably all had the painful experience of wrapping our shin against newly rearranged furniture. The fewer changes that you can make in the physical space, the better it is as far as a person with dementia's ability to adapt. We've already talked about electrical cords with regards to overloading, but you also need to think about them as a tripping hazard. Make sure cords are not stretched across doorways or snaking under chairs. Check to be sure that stair railings are solid and that there's not any chance that if of it pulling away if the person were to trip and slam their weight onto the railing as they grab it to prevent them tumbling down the stairs. Another thing to look at with stairs is whether there's carpet on the stairs. Is it tacked down properly? Are there fraying bits on the leading edges of the treads as the carpet has become worn over time? And if you have those little runners on the stairs, are they tacked down securely? Is it possible to catch your foot on the corner and trip? One thing that can be really helpful is to check out one of the falls clinics in your community, usually through home health, home community care. At a falls clinic, they will do an assessment of a person's stability and assess their likelihood of falls and then make some recommendations. Through a falls clinic, you can also get an occupational therapist to, do, uh, to come and do an assessment of your home. When it's our own living space, after a while, we often just don't see things anymore. For example, a shaky railing on the stair that you've just gotten used to not putting any weight onto it. And after a while, you don't even remember that it's shaky and unstable. So having someone else come in can be very helpful.
We have many options when considering locks for windows and doors. The key question is, who needs to operate the lock and how many entrances and exits do we need? It's never safe to lock someone in a home, but it's safe to consider permanently locking some doors and windows, adding door alarms where appropriate, and ensuring that a safe entrance and exit route are available at all times. A door alarm is a relatively simple piece of equipment that will set off a buzzer or an alarm when the door is opened and the contact is broken. This can be helpful if it's no longer safe for the person living with dementia to go outside on their own, and if the care partner wants to ensure that they're alerted when the door is opened. You can also consider different types of locks for different purposes. So for example, it may be that the garage door or the side door gets designated as the main entrance to the home, and therefore it has a basic deadbolt lock. The front door may be permanently bolted with a barrel bolt situated either, either high or low on the door out of kind of regular eye line um, eyesight and easy reach and there may be a door alarm put in place. Windows in the home could be set to open but only at four inches each. Backup keys need to be kept in a safe easily accessible space. We know that those keys are going to get lost at some point so consider cutting several extra keys. Spare keys could be left with a neighbor or if there's no safe place to leave an extra key, house, there are combination locks now for front doors. When a person with dementia lives alone, all these options will need to be kept as simple and straightforward as possible. There are a number of companies that have personal alarms available either as pendants, bracelets, keychains, and with a variety of functionality from simple panic alarms with a very loud alarm when set off, or with a, all the way to alarms that have fall detection, um, either with monitoring or not. It's important to note that a fall alarm won't detect every single fall. So for example, if you were to just kind of slowly slump down, the alarm probably wouldn't register that that wouldn't register that as a fall. But if you were to fall over abruptly, what we truly think of as a fall, then the fall alarm detects that and then the person doesn't need to press the button. Either a loud siren is set off or if there is monitoring, a call goes through to the call center or to the care partner. And with the increasingly large variety of smart watches, you can have health monitoring, built-in GPS locator, and automatic falls detection incorporated right into your smartphone smart watch app. The thing with personal alarms is that sometimes we get them for the person living with dementia at the point that we think they need them, but then they never use them. So you go over to your mom's place and she's fallen and she's sitting on the living room floor and she tells you she's been sitting there since yesterday. She's got her little pendant around her neck and you say, mom, why didn't you push the button? And she says, what button? Because this is new learning for her. And with the changes in the brain, new learning is no longer possible. So we think we're helping by having these alarms, but if you get them at the point where it's very difficult for someone to incorporate that into their learning, then it might not be as helpful as you hope, other than the automatic fall detection aspect. And so again, we come back to the importance of reviewing and discussing safety as early as possible and to include everyone in the discussion as much as possible. When you're trying to provide safety for a person who is living alone, 
it can help to have a friend check on them on a regular basis, especially if you're not in the same town. It can be just a quick check, you know, have the neighbor pop by in the morning. How are you doing, Louise? Everything okay? Just to make sure that somebody has eyes on them or on a regular basis. Whether you're living on your own or whether you're living with someone with dementia, it's critical to have emergency numbers ready at hand. If there is an emergency, that is the worst time in the world to be trying to find a phone number because you'll be in a panic and not thinking clearly. So have a little board posted up right by each telephone with emergency numbers and your home address. Or paste a list of emergency numbers along with your home address into the front of the phone book or up by the back door. Again, consulting with an occupational therapist can help give you a sense of any gaps in the safety measures that you've put in place in your home. And as mentioned previously, it may be appropriate to consider a monitored personal alarm that can be triggered in the event of a fall or other emergency. Due to the physical changes happening in the brain, a strong urge to walk can be a common experience for people living with dementia. Because it can also be connected with disorientation, people living with dementia may not be able to find their way back home and become lost. This can occur at any time of the day or night. It is particularly scary if it happens at night. And certainly if the person is wandering outdoors, that can be dangerous because of traffic issues, extreme weather, even just the distance someone can travel quickly. The need to get out and walk, also referred to as wandering, it's not dangerous in and of itself. It's a way for the person to work through emotions, to work through anxiety, work through extra energy, so in and of itself, it's not a problem. However, it often becomes a problem because the person doesn't have a safe space to move. So it's important that if in fact the person does like to head out, then wherever possible arrange the environment so that it would be safe for them to do that. About 60% of people with dementia will at some point experience that strong need to walk frequently. So this is an issue that many of you will in fact have to deal with at some point. Consider registering the person with our Medical Alert Safely Home program to assist emergency responders to identify the person who is lost and bring the family back together. This is a, a shared program between Medic Alert and the Alzheimer's Society. There will be a link just below this recording. As we mentioned previously with alarms, a smartwatch may have a GPS locator app on it, or you may want to discuss some other kind of locating devices. The Alzheimer's Society, we don't recommend any particular device, but we do suggest that this is a conversation you should have together as early as possible so that you can clearly define what you are and are not comfortable with when it comes to your own safety. Some people feel strongly that their privacy is so important they would not want to be tracked with a locating device. And so those are important conversations to have early. The Alzheimer's Society has a good handout on locating devices, as well as on disorientation and getting lost. And those are listed in the description below this video, along with a link to a short video on personal safety, which has a focus on disorientation and wandering. So let's go back to our nightmare picture from the beginning of today's session. You've heard a lot of information in a fairly short amount of time. So have a look at this picture now and identify one risk, especially if it's one you didn't know, notice the first time you saw the picture. The electrical cords, 
the medication, something else. Now think about one thing you can do to mitigate that risk and write down a plan for the coming week. Of course, if it's a risk that you have in your own home. To summarize, we've looked at a wide range of safety concerns in the home, and I encourage you to identify some key safety risks in your own home, especially those that might exist or be intensified because of the impact of dementia. Hopefully, you can start creating a plan to minimize and get around some of the risks. I suggest picking out one room at a time to focus on and using the checklist or the resource guide to develop a plan. Have open discussions, if you can, about the changes that dementia is likely to bring and how you can help to prepare now for safety concerns later. And remember that an occupational therapist or a professional specializing in safety can help to provide solutions. Learn more about wandering and safety measures and consider some resources that may lessen some safety issues. Again, there are a number of links in the more information um, description below this video. And remember, no one thing is going to ensure the safety of the person living with dementia. If you have questions about the information you've heard today or any other questions about living with dementia, don't hesitate to call our First Link Dementia Helpline with English services available Monday to Friday between 9 a.m. and 8 p.m. Our Cantonese or Mandarin and Punjabi services are available Monday to Friday from 9 to 4 and the numbers are listed on the screen.